Okay, uh, so I'm very pleased to uh, welcome Dr. Grace Lindsay uh, to the conversation today. Uh, Grace is a computational neuroscientist um, uh, who has been working in, in uh, building models of neuroscience in her research for a while. And uh, uh, Grace got her undergraduate degree in neuroscience at the University of Pittsburgh, and then did a PhD in computational neuroscience uh, at Columbia University in New York. And currently, uh, she is a postdoc at University College in London. And she has just come out with a really great book. Uh, her first one, it's called uh, Models of the Mind. Okay. Another quirk of Zoom, but, uh, and uh, it's, okay, I'm gonna read it out. It's, it's called Models of the Mind, How Physics, Engineering, and Mathematics Have Shaped Our Understanding of the Brain. It's a really great book. Um, it's extremely wide ranging. It deals with um, a topic that you usually don't find in, in books about neuroscience that you know talk about consciousness or that talk about biological approaches to the brain. Uh, so I'm very excited to, uh, to have read this book and, and to have a conversation with her about it. So welcome, Grace. Thank you. Okay, great. So maybe we can just start with, uh, you know, what, what brought you to writing this book? Was there a gap that you thought should be filled? Was it based on your own research? Where did the motivation come from? Yeah, um, it definitely, I mean, it wasn't, it was so obviously I'm a computational neuroscientist, so I'm aware of, you know, this area of research. Um, and it was based a little bit just on my own personal experiences and the fact that if I told someone I was a computational neuroscientist, they didn't know what that was. Um, so uh, it was clear to me that while there's plenty written about the brain and there's definitely an audience for books about the brain, um, the you know stories that have been told about how we study the brain never really included the computational mathematical side of things um and even within the field of neuroscience at least when i got started in um, neuroscience more than 10 years ago now as an undergraduate uh it didn't seem like the computational side was even that well represented or respected to some extent <laughs> amongst um, people in the field that's changed a lot i think in the past 10 years um it's becoming much more explicitly acknowledged that that we're going to need to use computational models to understand the brain um but yeah so it was clear to me that just there wasn't a representation of this field, certainly not in anything public science uh, related. And so I wanted to create something that you could point to and be like, that's what computational neuroscience is. And that's a little complicated because computational neuroscience is a lot of things. Um, but at the same time, we do tend to call all of it computational neuroscience. And if you go to certain computational neuroscience conferences, you might see things from very different fields, you know, modeling very different aspects of the brain from cells up to uh, populations of neurons and behavior and all kinds of things. So um, yeah, I just wanted to create a book that represented that and explained it in a friendly way to a general audience such that people could understand how exciting it is. Because when I first learned about computational neuroscience, I was like, oh, this is like, this is it. This is how we got to study the brain. Um, so I just kind of want to pass that feeling on to other people who probably have never heard of this field. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a that's a great reason to to write the book. Uh, I certainly don't think a lot of people have heard about it. What's interesting that is that uh, computational biology in general has really come into its own in the last couple of years. Uh, you know, it wasn't really on the radar. And I kind of feel that that's what has happened with neuroscience as well. Although, as you document here, you know the the sort of loosely defined subject of computational neuroscience is pretty old because you know you you talk about Hermann von Helmholtz and you know people going back to the 19th century who were sort of loosely working on ideas that now we would really call computational neuroscience so it just looks like it took a while for those ideas to percolate into the mainstream yeah very much so and to kind of yeah become something that we put under one heading um, but that's even more reason why, you know, as I was writing the book, I kind of uh, learned about this long history, some of which I knew about from being in the field, but there was a lot that I didn't know. And I think it's even interesting to people in the field to learn about this because um, it just shows that some ideas that you kind of take for granted, actually, you know, that's not what people thought in the past. And it required some mathematical thinking or influence from someone from engineering or physics or something like that to get us to the point where we view the brain a certain way. Um, and to just have that kind of explicitly laid out in, in the narrative is, is what I wanted to provide uh, to people to understand, you know, the long history of where our current ideas come from. 
Yeah, and that's that's a great point. That thing that you just said about you know people taking certain things for granted, and then finding out that those things are not quite the way they think are. You know, uh, one idea that emerges really well from your book is the whole idea of thinking of the brain as as a connected network, right? And I get the feeling that if you talk to a layman and ask them, you know, is the brain a connected network? They're going to be of course, it's a network, right? You know, there's all these neurons, they must be connected to each other. But then you all actually describe how, you know, there are so many complexities and subtleties to that network. It's just not just like a uniform network of neurons, right? And at one point, uh, you talk about something called a small world network. And you say that, you know, the, the brain seems to approximate, at least in some aspects, these small world networks. So m maybe say a few words about that. Um, yeah, so this is... Um based on the use of graph theory or what's called network science uh, in neuroscience. And so um, network science is used for a lot of different things, including analyzing social networks. That's part of, um, that's a little bit how it got started and especially this term small world got started because uh, you know, there's a colloquial phrase of like, oh, it's such a small word, world if you accidentally meet someone who, you know, is your friend's best friend or something and you just meet them out of nowhere. It's like, oh, the world's so small, we're all connected. Um, and that was, you know, formalized in this mathematical concept, which um, looks at a graph, which when, if we think about the brain, we can kind of map it to a graph um, in this graph theory sense by thinking of either neurons or brain regions as nodes in a graph, and then the connections between them are edges. And so nodes and edges are the main thing that make up graphs, and you can map a lot of different things to that structure. In the brain, we would map it with neurons and brain regions. Um, and uh, yeah, so you can kind of come up with a graph representation of the brain or a particular area of the brain, and then you can do this analysis to see if it kind of counts as a small world, which basically means that you could get from any one node to any other node only traversing a small number of edges. So you can kind of connect any two people with only a small number of connections. That would be the equivalent in a social network. And that's actually what that um, game that people play, the six degrees of uh, Kevin Bacon or whoever you want to play it with, whatever famous person, if you can try to connect people based on what movies they've been in and that kind of thing. Um, so basically those same structures that are used to analyze networks of many different kinds, you can use that to define or at least um, describe the structure of brain networks. Um, and see kind of how that relates to different things, uh, different functions. Right. And what seems to be the main, um, you know, main purpose of having the brain structured in this small world network kind of way? Is it to minimize the use of energy or to increase the speed of communication? Yeah, so there's there are things that people hypothesize why this might be the case, um, because it is the case that a lot of different types of analysis have kind of concluded that the brain does look like a, a small world network. Um, and yeah, so energy efficiency is, is a big one of those. The idea that um, basically the way that you can get a small world is if you have nearby neurons form clusters with each other, and maybe only one of those neurons in the cluster sends a connection to another cluster. And so you have a bunch of separate uh, clusters that have a few long range connections. And that's beneficial in the brain because there's kind of a cost to wiring in the brain and mm -hmm. building a bunch of connections amongst neurons that are very close to each other that can have kind of cheap connections um, is a good use of that wiring cost. And then occasionally you have one of the more expensive connections that goes in between the clusters. Um, and it's more expensive in the brain because it's long Longer and it has to be insulated to uh, keep the electrical signal alive along that long channel. So there's definitely an energy reason for wanting to organize the brain that way. Right, absolutely. And I think that that leads to another fascinating point you make, which is you talk about how neurons in the brain develop uh, during early development, uh, you know, in the first year or so of life. And you talk about this sort of explosive growth of neurons that are, that are then pruned back uh, you know, after the first year, and you make the point that this is very different from how, you know, an engineer, for instance, would design a network, right? They wouldn't just like have all these unnecessary connections and then prune it back. So it does look like the, the brain is doing something special there that you usually won't think of doing. Yeah, and that has, uh, well, it's believed that that has to do with, you know, the fact that there isn't an engineer of the brain, there isn't someone that can say this is how you should hook things up the best you can do is hook everything up and then see which connections get used and which don't and then get rid of the ones that don't so it's not an optimal way to do it but it's the only way you can do it if you have you know no top-down organization and you just have to 
see what works best. It's like trial and error kind of, which right. is different than how we build physical systems. Mm -hmm. And how much of that would be a product of evolution? Because we know that evolution is a very messy process, right? So you would think that evolution will try out a few things and then sometimes it can't always get rid of structures that it has already designed because the cost of getting rid of those structures is actually higher than the cost of keeping them and building on top of them. And that's that's partly what I was thinking when I when I read about that aspect of, of brain growth. Yeah, that's interesting. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, the, I don't know enough about the evolutionary history to know um, where this kind of overgrowth and uh, pruning strategy arose and, and uh, kind of what caused it to stick around. I think in very simple organisms, you probably don't see that as much just because they do have more laid out neurosystems, um, you know, where there are specific cell types that are connected in certain ways. And so you can kind of just build exactly what it is and will be. But in organisms where there's more adaptation to the environment you do want to do this you know see see what's useful and then prove back right and and you know that actually leads to a, a, another question that could potentially have a, a you know pretty big cultural impact which is that if this is actually how the brain develops let's say in the first year and then some connections are pruned back how much can the environment influence that growth and that pruning back right so you know if, if you have a baby growing in their first year you know how does how do different stimuli from the environment actually uh dictate the the pruning back and growth of these neurons so does does it have an impact yeah 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 and so that um the so yeah we've been kind of talking about network neuroscience and that kind of thing but that actually connects to a few other a lot of other topics in neuroscience, of course. Um, and so there's definitely this notion of, you know, use it or lose it for neural connections and um, Hebbian learning, which is uh, summarized as the neurons that fire together, wire together. So mm -hmm. what you're exposed to, the stimuli that come into your brain, they're going to dictate which neurons are active at the same time. And then that's going to strengthen connections between those neurons and the neurons that aren't active at the same time will usually have their connections weakened. And so that will, you know, sculpt out um, a shape in the neural connectivity that's based very much on the stimuli that you're uh, encountering. Um, and then, uh, there's also um, kind of, uh, you can think of it as a more normative approach to understanding this, which is um, related to information theory, um, which is uh, yeah, a separate chapter in the book. But uh, the idea there is that you, know, you want your neural activity patterns to reflect in some way the statistics of the environment that you're in um, so that you are kind of uh, encoding things efficiently and optimally. Um, and if we take that kind of approach by looking at information theory and try to understand the properties of neurons in the visual system or the auditory system, you do come to the conclusion that, um, you know, the things that these neurons are responding to uh, are very well suited for the environment that we're in. So in the visual system, you respond, the um, neurons in the early uh, cortical areas of the visual system respond to oriented lines. That's like the base unit of visual processing. And it just turns out that that's a very efficient way to encode natural images, the kind of images that we see in the world. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of different lenses through which you can kind of ask the question of how does both experience and lifetime and also evolutionary experience uh, lead to you know, the properties of neural firing. Right, and, and that to me is, is actually a wonder what you said about uh, you know, neurons responding to the environment because you know, if you think about it sort of from a naive standpoint, in their first few years or first few months of life, you know, children get exposed to a very stochastic environment. It's full of noise, right? I mean, it's not structured. There's a lot of, you know, wide variety of sights and sounds and smells around, right? But to me, it's, it's absolutely wondrous that somehow the developing brain can sort of, in some sense, still cut through all that noise and mm -hmm. then still make out the basic features of the environment like the the lines and and you know mm -hmm. angles that that you talked about so that that seems like you know there's there's a lot of uh you know it, in, in some ways it's a very efficient system because it can it seems to keep out a lot of the noise or at least what we think of noise maybe you know maybe kids don't right uh, and really focus on the essential features yeah yeah and i mean this is something that people are trying to replicate in machine learning all the time uh to just you know give uh artificial intelligence access to data from the world and see if it can pick out what the relevant concepts are and yeah it does seem like a lot of noise to us but then if you really compare 
you know, the inputs that a child gets with something that's truly random. I mean, there's a lot of structure, even if the kid yeah. is just wandering around and their eyes are glancing wherever, you're still getting the structure of the visual environment, um, which is very strong. And you're getting some coherence in the sense that things at one point in time are relatively similar to what they are at the next point in time. And if you move your head, you can see the same thing from a slightly different angle. And all of those are cues that you can use to uh, you know, figure out what really are the real objects in the world and what the best way to parse your uh, incoming information is. Right. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. The one thing I know, you know, when when I'm speaking with my daughter is that the head of the shape of my head will stay the same. Right. If it actually changed, that would be truly stochastic. That that might yeah. be unnerving. Yeah. for her. Yeah, absolutely. This is actually a great segue since you mentioned machine learning. Uh, you spent some time talking about uh, neural networks and convolutional neural networks. And, you know, obviously that's that's a big deal these days. It's big money. They've had an impact on a lot of uh, areas of engineering and technology. Uh, but it, it does look like, uh, you know, some people uh, in, in particular, as you know, Gary Marcus, uh, Melanie Mitchell, they've actually pointed out that, you know, these neural networks, they're not really going to lead to, you know, true AI, because there's no symbolic representation uh, of the world. And there's no sort of physics based learning that that these AIs do that our brains do. So do, do you sort of see the, the same issues arising and, uh, you know, potential solutions by by which this kind of you know, the, the work that you have described in this book could improve the, the state of AI and neural networks. Yeah, I think that's a little complicated because there's always a sense that, you know, when we say these artificial neural networks can't do something, it's a, it's a function of what point in time we're making that statement. <laughs> so there are things obviously that artificial neural networks aren't great at right now. Um, and this kind of more abstract reasoning, you know, pulling stuff out of the environment and then reasoning with it in some way. Um, yeah, it's definitely a challenge for these networks. And what they're really good at is more immediate perception kind of things. Um, you know, there's, a, I think it was Joshua Bengio, who's a famous uh, AI researcher who said that, you know, uh, artificial neural networks can do things that take your brain less than a second. That's like where they excel in, in these more immediate tasks, which are actually very complicated and we didn't understand for a long time how the brain does stuff like vision and that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, then, you know, you move on to, you know, actually using that information that you extract from the environment and, and that is more difficult. I, my gut instinct is always, you know, the brain is a neural network. It's a bunch of neurons interconnected and it does what we call symbolic reasoning. Hmm. So somehow <laughs> interconnected neurons can do symbolic reasoning. And the question is how, hmm. um, but then, you know, so in some sense, yes, artificial neural networks, if we made them close enough to the brain would have to be able to do, to do that uh, kind of stuff. There's a separate question, though, of will that be the most efficient route to artificial intelligence, or should we have some sort of dual system where you extract information from the world with artificial neural networks, and then you collapse it to some more symbolic reasoning uh, programming language? Hmm. Um, the, you know, that's just up to the people who are designing AI and what they want out of it and, you know, the constraints that they have. Um, so, yeah, I think I, I understand, you know, where the critique is coming from. It's a legitimate critique. And um, I understand the sense of like, we should just move beyond artificial neural networks for the sake of AI and explore other things, that seems fine. But as someone trying to understand and know about the brain, at some point we have to explain how neurons do symbolic reasoning. <laughs> That's just right, right. It's part of neuroscience it, it, to understand that. Right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, you know, you, you, you know that neurons do symbolic reasoning, so you have to incorporate that. Uh, one other, very interesting uh, uh, aspect of the brain that that you do, did mention briefly before is information theory and information theoretic approaches. And you know, personally, uh, as as someone who deals a lot with sort of thermodynamics and materials and so on, as a chemist, I find that really interesting because, in some sense, that's sort of the opposite of uh, you know what we are talking about, which is going from the very abstract. Uh, I actually think of information theory as providing a, a connection between that very abstract level of thinking to something more concrete. And that connection, you know, personally, I see it happening through entropy because, you know, information is related to entropy. Entropy is directly uh, a, a consequence of the thermodynamic processes uh, occurring in the brain, right? And part of what you uh, mentioned in the chapter on information theory is this whole idea, which I find very interesting of sparse versus redundant coding in the brain. And, uh, you know, uh, so 
two 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 questions, I guess. Uh, one is, you know, what is your take on, uh, uh, you know, information theory making a contribution in the future to our understanding of models of the mind, uh, uh, especially grounded in thermodynamics? Because we, at at some point, you know, the brain is crunching symbols, but it's also using up a lot of energy. Twenty percent of the body's energy used by an organ that's only two percent of of the body's weight, right? And so, what's your take on information theory and thermodynamics? And then, you know, maybe also say a few words about this whole idea of sparse versus redundant, because different people seem to come up with, you know, either of those approaches, essentially. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was very, um, there was a time when information theory was new, uh, and it was really getting applied to a lot of things in a very excited way. People in biology and neuroscience Um we're really excited because obviously we have this sense that the brain processes information <laughs> and even before people explicitly called it that or anything like that that's just you know the default notion of what we think that thinking is and therefore it's what the brain does um and so obviously a system that could formalize that and look and uh, make it so that you can look at the brain and measure you know how much information is in the brain or in a particular brain area about any given thing that seems very very useful um I think that there's been, so even very shortly after this uh, application to neuroscience, people started to be a little concerned about what we were really learning about the brain from um, applying the information theoretic lens to it. Uh, and I think there still is, you know, we leveled out somewhere in between excited and, uh, you know, concerned, I think. Um, and for me, I think there is a slight issue in um, kind of taking information theory, which was designed as a way of understanding communication and applying it to the brain, which is in some ways meant to do more computation. So mm -hmm. when you think about uh, information theory, it's you know about designing a code that's efficient and can help you send a certain set of information from one place to another. It's not about how do you transform that information into some other thing that can then do a task or anything like that. It's just how do you send a given set of information. Um, and so, you know, that happens in the brain to some extent. There's these connections, um, you know, between neurons that are sending signals, but a lot of times those connections are also supposed to be doing computations. And so you don't want to just decode the same message that you encoded. And so a focus on information theory comes with it, a focus on decoding the same information that you've encoded, which is not really what we think, you know, the connections in the brain are doing all the time. And so I think that's where it, it has its limitations uh, and where you have to be careful in how you're applying it if you're really answering the question that people are asking about the brain. Um, and yeah, so this, this notion of sparse coding is, um, it's something that people reference a lot, particularly in sensory neuroscience. So like thinking about how sensory systems are organized. And in some ways it can work as an assumption that you make to then think about um, how, like what a neuron should be responding to in the environment, which yeah, is related to what I was saying before about how you break down you know, your inputs into um, you know, the right kind of sub components. So, um, so if there are things in the environment that co-occur a lot, um, then you shouldn't have, you know, a bunch of different neurons that are firing for all those things because they're showing up all together in the environment most of the time. So you should collapse that into a single neuron that represents that one thing um, that's out there. So the canonical example of this amongst neuroscientists is known as the grandmother cell, which is supposed to be a cell in your brain that responds only to your grandmother and nothing else. And so it's just, you know, if there's a certain set of things like your grandma's glasses and her clothes and her perfume or something that all co-occur, you just represent all of that as the, in the grandmother cell and that grandmother cell doesn't respond to anything else. Um, and so that's, you know, an extreme variant of what, you know, the brain could look like. And people think that it's not quite as sparse as all that, um, that there usually is some distributed coding. But again, it's more, it's more a lens through which you can look at some responses and try to make sense of, well, why does it respond to uh, this stimulus and not that one? Or why is this what the, the pattern of neural activity looks like? Well, maybe this neural network is implementing some sort of sparse coding strategy, and this is what matches the, the input statistics the best is a way to think about it. Right. And redundancy uh, just seems to be a, a way of foolproofing 
or the brain to some extent, right? You just, just like you have redundant systems built into critical engineering systems like dams and, and you know, nuclear reactors and so on. It looks like, you know, you want some amount of redundancy uh, just to make sure that, you know, you can have multiple answers to the same problem if one of the answers fails. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You can have redundancy in terms of multiple neurons that respond in similar ways, and you can have redundancy in the sense that different neural circuits can perform the same function. So different ways of connecting neural circuits, you can end up with the same function in the end. And that is definitely something that evolution has has come to use uh, a lot to be robust. Right, right. Yeah, what, one thing that reminded me of was the, um, was the whole uh, research done by Linda Buck and Richard Axel at, at Columbia uh, into olfactory neurons, where you know they found out this sort of combinatorial encoding, where you know you have multiple sets of neurons that can recognize one kind of smell or one kind of note, but then you can also have multiple smells recognized by one neuron. So it's this sort of one to many and many to one mapping, and it does seem like that might be this whole idea of combinatorial encoding and redundancy might be a much more general feature. Yeah, brain. but it, it makes the brain hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think there was this, um, I forget the name, maybe Gary Marcus wrote it, but but I think it was, uh, the book was called Kluge, and it was basically about like how, how much, so much, so many biological systems, they're sort of hacked together through billions of years of evolution, right? And that yeah. makes them intrinsically hard to understand, although it obviously makes them really interesting and, you know, they work really well. Um, yeah, and I would say that um, I feel like most neuroscientists don't actually know much about the evolution of the nervous system. It's hmm. not something that's really focused on. Um, and there is um, a professor, Paul Chisek, who is kind of pushing in the direction of like, hey, guys, pay attention to evolution if you want to understand why the brain is the way it is. And I think that that is a perspective that is probably, I hope, gaining some steam. Um, but yeah, it's, it's hard. I think part of the reason that we don't focus on evolution that much is that it's hard. It's hard to do. It's hard to trace the evolutionary history of the particular brain region you're interested in and have the skills to do that as well as to do the neuroscience that you're doing. Um, yeah, so it, it's, it's easier to kind of take the approach that is more inspired by mathematical modeling, which says like, let's assume the brain is optimal in some way. Let's calculate what the optimal way for the brain to work is. Let's just hope that evolution found the best solution and not worry about the fact that it's actually, you know, based on a bunch of random things that happened in the past. Right, right, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then try to make sense of the brain, just assuming it's roughly as, as good as we would have designed it ourselves. Right, yeah. Yeah, that reminds me of the quote, you know, the famous quote from uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense unless you see it through the lens of evolution. So yeah. it's, it's uh, but but you're right. I mean, I think it's, it's better to think of evolution as having already done something and then ask how you can study it instead of like trying to figure out the process, which is, which is very messy, basically. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, that leads me to another uh, point. And, you know, I had written a, a post about this a while ago, but this was basically about analog versus digital computing and how it might apply to the brain. Because, you know, obviously the whole idea of studying the brain as, as, as a neural network for instance, that led to the belief that, you know, a lot of the brain is basically just like a digital computer. And, you know, that analogy has been misused, as, I, as I'm sure you, you know much better than I, by a lot of people. And now it seems, you know, some people are thinking, you know, George Dyson, who I interviewed uh, before uh, here, uh, you know, he certainly seems to think that uh, we are not paying enough attention to the analog processing part of the brain. And there's no reason to think that 100% of, of the brain is basically digital. And, you know, one of the features of analog processing is that it's not as efficient as digital uh, digital processing, but it can do things that digital processing can't. And, you know, uh, they have come up with some things like computing certain kinds of numbers uh, that can be done much better. You, you Well, that can be done more precisely using analog computing and so on. Uh, so, you know, are, are, are you familiar with attempts to sort of study this, uh, this whole dichotomy with, uh, between, you know, analog and digital computing in the brain? Or um, Yeah, I mean, I'm somewhat familiar. I think there's a book coming out by um, Corey Malley that's on this topic, uh, but I haven't read it yet. Um, so, yeah, but it's, it's interesting because in my mind, so... Yeah, there's a lot to unpack here, which <laughs> it feels like it's simple enough to say like the brain is like a computer and is it analog or digital? But yeah, even that sentence, the brain is like a computer or is a computer is yeah, explosive and for some reason. Um, so um, yeah, personally, I think 
when people say the brain is a computer, I take that as a literal statement. It is a thing that processes information. Um, that doesn't mean to me that it works the same way as our laptops or our phones or anything like that. It's just, those are different types of computers. Um, so that's how I think about it. And then, yeah, there's, there's different ways that a computer can compute. Um, so, um, but so in the history of the development of modern computers, the notion of using, you know, binary zero one stems from neurons and the fact that they either fire or they don't fire. And so neurons themselves are kind of binary. In modern neuroscience, we've kind of switched to almost just thinking of neurons as analog because um, they, we think of them more in terms of firing rates instead of spiking yes or no, at least in a lot of systems neuroscience. So now when you think of, you know, what is the activity level of a neuron? It's not a zero one. It's a, you know, it could be 55 spikes per second or something like that. Um, some, some rate value. Uh, and so I think it, it's almost as though, you know, there isn't in some sense, there like isn't an answer to what the brain is doing because it depends on just how we choose to define and study it um, in terms of, you know, is it more like a binary system or more of a continuous system? Um, but I know there are other, you know, elements to it being digital versus analog that um, that people care about. But mm -hmm. for me, it's just it seems maybe just a question of interpretation sure. rather than, yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, the brain is doing whatever the brain is doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that exactly. involves spikes and it involves rates of spikes. And there are some neurons or other cells in the brain that don't signal using spikes. They have more just like fluctuating signals. And oh, there's, okay. you know, calcium signaling within a neuron that. Uh, is not binarized and all of that. So the brain is doing what it's doing and <laughs> we can choose to interpret it probably in many different ways. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, you know, I'll, 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 so, so you were talking about the frequency of spiking that that is very important to understand uh, when you're trying to interpret the data. Um, you know, one thing that kept on going through my mind as a chemist is that, of course, you know, the brain is sort of a combination of electricity and chemistry, if you will, right? I mean, there's a lot of neurotransmitters being transmitted. And, you know, I always wonder if, if anyone is trying to form connections when they're building these models uh, between, you know, a lot of the efforts that you're talking here, are any of them trying to take into account the exact chemistry of the brain? Or that is something that is sort of the underlying substrate and you're just abstracting away from it all the time? Um, yeah, that's interesting. So obviously, you know, there are people who are neuroscientists who are studying more neurons as they are cells and not so much as they are networks of information processing units and all of that. You know, there are people who are studying the biology of neurons. Um, and neurotransmitters and, and all of that. Um, and so that's part of neuroscience. The extent to which it relates to mathematical modeling and computational neuroscience, um, I guess that's kind of probably where things maybe blend a little bit into computational biology, which seems like it would be very tightly connected to computational neuroscience, but actually in my mind and my understanding in a lot of people's minds, they're very separate, uh, like computational biologists kind of have their own language and, and culture and conferences and computational neuroscientists are usually not there. Um, <laughs> but I think it's because usually computational neuroscientists are focusing more on information processing and these like perhaps more abstract things. Um, but there are people who, you know, do mathematical modeling of the dynamics of individual neurons and their voltage responses and um, you know take into account the actual physical shape of neurons and and all of that um and then i'm sure that there are people who are doing detailed simulations of the actual you know like neurotransmitters crossing a synapse and how they're interacting with um receptors on the other end and and all of that the kind of biophysics of all of that um yeah but yeah i guess it just insofar as it's so removed from the more abstract topics, it does feel kind of like a totally different field that is more related to cellular biology than it is to right. neuroscience itself. But then at the same time, you know, you try to understand a particular neural circuit and how it does the information processing that it does. And sometimes it turns out that it's, you know, the properties of this synapse and the time scale of the receptors. And, you know, that's key to understanding it. So, right, right. Uh, so you to yeah. get into those details then. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and parallel with the chemistry, you know, I, I also want to ask about the impact of genomics, you know, because that clearly seems to have impacted every other area of biology. And, you know, how much has that impacted uh, 
uh, the kind of models that uh, that people are building that you describe it, especially in terms of uh, you know reading out individual DNA or RNA signals from individual neurons or from groups of neurons. Yeah, so where I see that come into play the most, and again, this is you know going to be based on my um, uh, like perspective as a computational neuroscientist who studies high level systems. Um, but where I see that coming the most is in the ability to kind of profile cell types and figure out, is there a natural clustering of different cell types in a brain area? So we know, you know, broadly, uh, some neurons in the brain are excitatory, which means that they release neurotransmitter that makes other neurons fire, and some are inhibitory, which means they stop other neurons from firing. And there are different, you know, excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters that the cells can release. And so there's some signature of that in um, the uh, proteins that they're producing and all of that. And right. so there are ways, and there's other just markers of different cell types um, in the brain. So there are ways to kind of read out different identities or populations of cell types um, based on you know features of, of uh, what they're expressing and all of that. And so that's, uh, I mean, there's a reason to study that in its own right, but that's also practically useful because then you can try and target specific cell types for manipulation in experiments or just to record from specific cell types. If you can um, find a unique way of identifying them, then you can start to study them in their kind of separate behavior, treating them as separate populations. And mm -hmm. so that's where I see the influence of that the most. Of course, people who study clinical neuroscience and disease progression and all of that, they have their own reasons to be uh, tied into the genetics literature. But in basic neuroscience, I think that's where it comes up the most is kind of profiling cell types. Hmm. Yeah, that, that certainly seems very useful. Um, I just want to move on. We have a few minutes left, but um, there are fascinating characters in this book. You know, there's Walter Pitts, you know, who one of the fathers of neural networks, uh, you know, who had a tragic life story. And, you know, there's uh, Edgar a Adrian, someone else I found very interesting. And then uh, Danielle B Bassett, uh, you know, I found her life story very interesting. That's that's one of the reasons what that, that makes this book so readable. You know, you have these capsule life histories of these scientists. Um, were there... Were there favorites that really sort of stayed with you when you started reading all this history? Yeah, yeah, it was really fun to dig into it. You don't get to do that a lot as a scientist. Um, and yeah, I feel like I had a taste of what it was like to be a historian. And I think people get really attached to certain figures that they study when they're historians as well. Um, I liked uh, Jerry Letvin, who was in the chapter on vision. Mm. Um, just because he seemed to, he seemed to show up a lot of different places and just was broadly interested in, um, a lot of things, but also, you know, sometimes people who do that are kind of, um, eccentric or, uh, like a little egomaniacal or something like that. He seemed very subdued, but yet just like casually everywhere, mm. uh, and just seemed like someone who would be, you know, a reasonable, but interesting person. <laughs> Right. <laughs> which is for some reason what I, I was most interested in. I yeah. think, you know, especially if you're looking at popular autobiographies or biographies, you know, they're highlighting the people who really had kind of crazy lives or, you mm -hmm. know, had who said a lot of crazy things or whatever it is. Um, so I think it was just nice to find someone who showed up a lot, but maybe as like the side character in a lot of stories. Yeah, sort of <laughs> the, the underdog who really made a difference, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then of course, at the end, um, you know, you talk, uh, th this was a great chapter to re read about you. You talk about grand unified theories of the brain and you talk about people who are trying to sort of build these uh, just similar to, to physics. And, you know, uh, obviously the, the whole idea of, of grand unified theories in, in physics has been sort of fraught with, you know, controversy. Uh, you know, people who pursued those ideas have, have been called crazy and so on. Um, uh, I, I personally think that, you know, it's always good if there's a few crazy people working on on a, on a few crazy things, as long as it's not too many. Uh, but uh, two of the people who I find very fascinating, one is Carl Friston, who has uh, become quite famous in recent years uh, for his advocacy of this uh, free energy principle. And I have to say that as a chemist, I not only found it very interesting, but I also found it rather obvious, but not in the sense that he means probably, in the sense that you know he was talking about our brain minimizing the free energy difference uh, by making predictions, you know, and then comparing them with the state of the world. Now, now is what is interesting is that in chemistry, uh, we, you know, chemists know this, you know, they talk about this all the time. They know that 
all natural spontaneous chemical reactions are ones that minimize uh, the free energy basically. And so for all natural spontaneous reactions, the free energy difference is actually negative. You start out with more free energy, you end up with, with less. And this is especially true in biochemistry where you, know, you look at all the major biochemical pathways and uh, all of them have negative free energy. So they're minimizing their free energies. And so this was a very sort of intuitive uh, idea uh, uh, to me at least, uh, but there were two things about it. One is that, um, you know, in the brain, you're not just talking about chemical reactions, right? You're going way beyond that. You're talking about, you know, probabilistic models that the, that the brain is constructing. Um, and so it seems much more complicated to apply mm -hmm. this to the brain. Uh, but another thing that's, uh, that really jumped out at me is that when you look at biochemical networks and you say, okay, you know, for this biochemical network like glycolysis or glucose synthesis, the free energy change is negative. What is interesting is that if you look at all the steps, that it's a multi-step reaction and the total free energy change is negative, but there may be individual steps for which it's actually positive. Mm -hmm. And then if you studied those ind individual steps out of context, you would wonder oh, why is this positive? And then you actually find that there's something pretty clever happening. You know, it's, it's like biology is paying a small price temporarily to minimize the overall free energy difference. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and this reminded me of one of, the, uh, one of the chapters where you talk about the reward system in the brain and you give this great example, I believe of a, a violinist playing uh, in, in the subway in New York City. And, and you talk about how sometimes she will take a route that's not really intuitive, but then if you look at the bigger picture, it sort of makes more sense. Uh, so I know I've, I've sort of rambled on here, uh, but generally your take on the free energy principle and uh, you know, what, do you, what do you see as its future? It, it seems one of those grand sort of theories that's not easily falsifiable, as you said, Friston mm -hmm. himself acknowledges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think that uh, the, there's some you know, um, credence that it gets because it taps into this physics idea of like, oh, minimizing free energy, of course. Um, but sometimes, you know, ideas that are imported from physics into neuroscience, they're imported almost at the same level. For example, the idea of modeling a neuron as an electrical circuit, like that is what it is in some sense. It's implemented with ions and, you know, cell membranes and stuff, but that is what it is. Um, this importing of free energy at the level of brain activity or even behavior. I mean, Friston has applied this at many different levels in the brain. Uh, then it becomes more of an analogy. And then you have to, you can't just take for granted that it can be imported as is. Um, and how exactly you map it onto, you know, what you're studying about the brain becomes maybe more a matter of opinion or interpretation. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how far you can go with it is also, you know, you have to be careful because it's not exactly the same level. It's its own thing now where you're just kind of taking inspiration from, from the physical idea. Um, so I think that's definitely an issue with the free energy principle. The idea that the brain makes predictions is something that exists outside of the free energy principle framework to understand the brain, as you said, with um, reinforcement learning, the idea that you have a prediction of what kind of reward you're going to get. Uh, you know, that's something that exists in other mathematical frameworks and just generally in how people study the brain. Uh, so yeah, I, <laughs> the, that chapter on grand unified theories, I mean, the truth is that most neuroscientists don't think that there will be grand unified theories of the brain because of what we were talking about with evolution, where it's just, it's a bunch of bits hacked together and who knows how they all work. There's absolutely no reason to assume that they all can be described by very simple principles. Right. Um, so I'm in that camp, um, but I wanted to include in the book, you know, that these are out there and these are definitely a way in which physics has influenced neuroscience, this notion that there should be grand unified principles and that we can come up with simple mathematical rules that are going to describe a whole lot about the brain. Um, so I think it's it's interesting in that kind of you know social way of thinking about how academics work and where they get their inspiration from. Um, and I think uh, perhaps it's inspired more people to think about predictions in the brain on various levels, and that's interesting too. I don't think that the exact framework or anything about that particular um, implementation of this idea is really going to be the key to anything. Um, and uh, I also mentioned in the book that, you know, people, 
have a hard time understanding exactly what Carl Friston is saying when he talks about this. That's a documented phenomena. So <laughs> um, that, you know, to me, that means that it, that should limit its impact because, you know, it's hard to make progress on something that you don't understand. Uh, so I think that, that that's also an issue as well if it's not if it's fundamentally, you know, not comprehensible, or if it's just not being communicated well enough, either way, that's a problem for um, the success of a theory. Right. No, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I I see values, you know, I see value in theories that that may be wrong because you know they still sort of stimulate you to think. But I think the lack of sort of quantitative predict prediction power and falsifiability, that's a bigger problem, right? Because uh, one of the pitfalls that leads uh, you into, as, as you know, is that you can fit any data to the theory then. And, you know, then, then you know, it's sort of anything goes, right? Um, I, I still feel, feel that it's, it's a useful framework to keep on thinking, uh, you know, about this probabilistic prediction machine that, that the brain is. But I think it would be nice if there were some quantitative predictions. Okay, you know, for this task, this is the free energy difference that we expect. Okay. You you know, if this, if if there's a disorder in the brain, you know, this is the free energy uh, difference that we expect. That that kind of thing would be. Yeah, right. and I think people do try that, but again, there's so many different ways you could map it that you could kind of come up with any different prediction if you're, you know, just taking it loosely. If it's not a very strong, solid, you know, no free parameters kind of model, then right. you can always wiggle it to, yeah, fit yeah. whatever data you have. Yeah, that's right. I, I think I think all of us, whether it's chemists, uh, biologists, neuroscientists, we suffer from physics envy, right? We you we want that one simple equation that's very quantitative, and you know Emmanuel Derman, who, who I'm sure you you know on Twitter, he was a physicist. He turned a, a financial modeler on Wall Street, and he has this famous quote that well, economists want to discover uh, you know one law that explains 99 percent of the data, but they'll more likely end up discovering 99 laws that end up explaining 1% of the data. And, yeah. and hopefully neuroscience won't be in, in that bad a spot, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but we have to be careful. Um, yeah. I, I actually think this is a great note to end on because I think what you said about you know, using uh, analogies from physics and mathematics to explain the brain, but not taking them to literally using them as guidelines, that really seems a, a, a very wise thing to do. Uh, uh, so are there, would there be any parting words of advice for for young computational neuroscientists who want to get into the field. Yeah, I mean, give it a go. Uh, <laughs> go. If you're, yeah, no matter if you're coming from the quantitative side or from the biology side, it's nice to have, you know, all kinds of influence in trying to figure this out. Yeah, that's right. All right, well, I'm going to try holding the book up again. Uh, uh, at the oh, right I had it for a second. So, yeah, yeah, I think <laughs> I had it for a second. Yeah, mm -hmm. this is so weird. <laughs> it's yeah, not I, a I face. There's, there's a good neurological. It. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> ah, there, there you go. go. <laughs> Just at the, the right height. I'm sure there's a good neurological explanation for why this is ha happening. But uh, anyway, models of the mind. It's it's a fascinating, very wide ranging book, uh, and I encourage everyone to take a look at it. Uh, Grace, thanks so much for your time. It was a real pleasure speaking with you, and I uh, wish you good luck with uh, both the book and and the research. Thank you so much. All right. Great. Take care now. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Bye.